start with a round. Of, I want to start with a round of introductions. Uh, I think some people know each other, but I want to make sure we all know everyone and and uh, what organization, if any, they're affiliated with. So I'm just going to start across my screen and go to <clears throat> to Jennifer first. Which Jennifer? I can go. Oh, Jennifer Wagley. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Oh goodness, two Jennifer. Go ahead, Jennifer. All right. Good morning. I'm Jennifer Wagley. I'm the CEO and executive director of Our Children Oregon. We're a whole child um, children's advocacy organization here for the state. Thanks, Jennifer. Mary Louise, nice to see you. Good to see you, Congresswoman. Mary Louise McClintock. I'm senior education strategy and policy advisor at Oregon Community Foundation. Thanks for joining us. Nancy. Had to unmute. Um, my name is Nancy Perrin. I'm the executive director with the Oregon Head Start Association, an early childhood education program that serves children and families um, across the state of Oregon. Terrific. Glad you're here. The other Jennifer, Jennifer Parrish Taylor. Uh, Jennifer Parrish Taylor. Uh, my pronouns are she and her. I'm with the Urban League of Portland as the director of advocacy and public policy. Great. Thank you. Donalda. Good morning, Donelda Dodson, Executive Director, Oregon Child Development Coalition. Thank, Thank you. you for us. Toya, great to see you. Good morning, Toya Fix, she, her, hers. I'm the Executive Director at Stanford Children here in Oregon. We're an education advocacy group, mainly focused on policy and finance at the state level. So it's great to see all of you. Nice to see you as well. Kali, nice to see you as well. Good morning, good to be seen. Um, I, my name is Kali Thornlad. I'm CEO of the Children's Institute. We are a re research policy and advocacy organization focused on children birth through third grade and ensuring their success throughout the state of Oregon. Terrific. Thank you. Tony, nice to see you. Good morning, Representative. Good to see you as well. Tony DeFalco. I use he, him, L pronouns. I serve as the executive director at Latino Network, and we are an advocacy and service organization uh, transforming lives of Latinx youth and families in the region. Great. Aaron. Good morning, apologies for being late. Erin uh, Dysart, she, her pronouns. I'm a um, strategic initiatives program officer at Meyer Memorial Trust, which is uh, a private foundation working on issues of equity and justice across Oregon. Thanks for joining us, Tracy. Great to see you. Thank you, great to see all of you this morning. Good morning, Tracy Rossi. I'm the executive director at Friends of the Children Portland and we're a mentoring organization and we serve um, the highest priority youth mentoring them from kindergarten through 12th grade. Great, you can see we have very experienced uh, voices and I'm looking forward to the conversation. I did skip over the media, but just so you know, we do have uh, media here today uh, covering this important topic. So uh, we, we know that the pandemic has, has taught us a, a great deal about the unmet needs in this country. And, and it's also exacerbated uh, the, the inequities that exist for children living in poverty. And I'm gonna make just a few comments, but really wanna open this up to discussion. Um, we know that addressing child poverty is an essential part of our economic recover and also, uh, recovery and also a moral obligation. Now, I'm, I'm a policymaker and I understand the importance of making investments that provide families with the resources and the support they need to survive, but also to flourish. And when we invest in children, we see positive long-term benefits for their overall health and well-being, as well as for their economic mobility. Our kids do better in school and live healthier lives when they aren't worrying about where their next meal is coming from or where they're gonna to sleep tonight. Uh, child poverty and the issues associated with it are systemic challenges and we have an unprecedented opportunity uh, to meet these challenges. And that means building a stronger economy, an economy that does not leave anyone behind. And that's why I wanna spend some time talking today about Build Back Better. In November, the House passed uh, the Build Back Better Act. This has historic investments that will expand economic opportunity for millions of working families. It will strengthen the economic and educational opportunities for families and children by delivering affordable childcare, uh, lowering costs for middle-class families, expanding access to universal pre-K for three and four-year-olds. And we know the economic crisis is not gonna end for families if they don't have access to quality childcare, 
The Build Back Better Act is actually projected to save most families more than half of their current spending on childcare at least, uh, and reach about 20 million children per year. And I also want to note that in our communities in the United States of America, there's no reason for any child to be hungry. The Build Back Better Act is going to help prevent child hunger by investing in nutrition programs that are proven to work. Uh, the pandemic EBT program, which we've seen the, the successes of during the pandemic, uh, has served million, millions of children during school closures, and it's going to continue until the end of this school year. The Build Back Better Act provides for a national summer EBT program to build off the success and make sure students are not left behind and hungry when school is out because unfortunately too many children rely on schools to get their meals. And if the schools are closed, that means their meals are gone. So the Build Back Better Act will address that with summer programs, but it also will expand eligibility for free school meals and eliminate a lot of the paperwork, which is something I've been working on for a long time. So as a senior member of the Education Labor Committee, I'm leading the child nutrition reauthorization, where our goal is to make these long-term investments. Uh, and under Build Back Better, families will continue to receive additional resources and a tax cut uh, from the Enhanced Child Tax Credit, which we passed in the American Rescue Plan earlier this year. And importantly, the Build Back Better Act corrects an inequity that was in the partisan Republican 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, uh, because the Build Back Better Act will restore access to the benefit for children of immigrant families. You know, children should not suffer because immigration reform has not passed Congress. And so we're going to fix that, make sure that uh, all hungry children receive uh, the benefit. So we, I want to note that the data from the Census Bureau shows that the child tax credit has already significantly reduced food and housing insecurity. It's estimated that about 93,000 families in Northwest Oregon have received roughly $219 million. Moms like Amanda and Newberg um, used the funds to pay for childcare so they could work and others use them for food, for utility bills, for other basic needs. So you all likely know that the last authorized payment goes out today and we're working to extend this and build back better because it really is making a difference. Um, I'm also supporting the, the legislation called the American Family Act that would permanently extend the Enhanced Child Tax Credit, the Build Back Better Act, um, which as you know is pending in the Senate, uh, is a beginning, but uh, this is a, a permanent extension that I'm supporting in the American Family Act. Because we know for low and middle income parents and especially parents of color, these checks have provided life-saving support. This provided critical economic stability during the ongoing pandemic. Families and communities have been struggling for too long. These investments will pay for themselves in the long run. And I want to note there's some other provisions that are in both the bipartisan infrastructure bill, which has passed uh, both chambers and been signed into law, the combination of these provisions in both in the infrastructure bill and build back better, uh, in addition to child care preschool uh, and the child tax credit, um, provisions that will lead to clean drinking water in homes and schools, lead paint removal, and importantly, robust investment in affordable housing. So build back better has about $170 billion investment in affordable housing for rent assistance, more housing choice vouchers, affordable preservation of existing affordable housing and public housing. So a lot of provisions there that will really truly help close these opportunity gaps. So I'm looking forward to hearing from all of you today uh, to hear your perspectives and, and not only how these current um, provisions like the child tax credit are making a difference, but what uh, looking to the future, what would make a difference for uh, meeting the needs of our children and families. I'm going to start by turning it over to Jennifer Wagley at Our Children Oregon, uh, because Jennifer has some data to show how the child tax cre credit has benefited families in Oregon. So Jennifer, I'll turn it over to you and then I'm going to uh, open it up. Yeah, thank you. And let me get my slides up. I'm working off of one screen today. So that is challenging when you're used to two screens, but let me present here. Um, and we, we so appreciate your leadership, Congresswoman, and um, being an advocate for the children of Oregon and also just being um, a leader across the nation of doing, doing the right thing for our kids. And so these slides are um, just to highlight some of the things you've already pointed out, but this is a poverty mapping of um, our 36 counties. And you can see this is actually from the American Community Survey. So this is one of the things that we do for the state is to, to keep track of, um, 
of what's going on. And you can see that there's a lot of entrenched poverty in um, the front frontier and rural counties. Um, and that where there's a cluster of resources here on in the I-5 corridor that we are making significant strides to support our families. Um, there's lots of different poverty measures, but Oregon has been leading the nation in reducing poverty over time. Um, and um, when you look at what's happened during the pandemic, you can see that um, for 10 years, we, were, uh, we had been decreasing poverty. Um, and so this line up here shows what would have happened if um, our congressional delegation had not acted to support our families. Um, we see that um, poverty would have drastically increased. And this is from the um, census pulse data that um, has been being procured throughout the pandemic. Um, and so relief works. We know that policy can impact our kids and that we need to do more because it's not, um, it's definitely not been um, steady and we know families are still, still struggling. To the child tax credit, um, so this is also from Pulse survey data, so it's not a huge sample size, but from 646 families um, that have received um, the child tax credit, obviously we've got work to do to make sure that all families across uh, the state can access the child tax credit. And, um, and the way that they've used those resources um, are exemplified here. Um, families are using uh, the, these dollars for, for food, for essential um, bills, for um, rent payments, to pay down debt. And so the narrative that families might be abusing this resource is uh, debunked in what the data says. And so our families are being supported by this important policy. And there's obviously a lot more um, to do, particularly in reaching out to those families that have not historically been um, qualified to, to file taxes or have not had to file taxes. We need to do a lot of outreach to them because they are definitely underrepresented in, in accessing this resource. Um, and we definitely support the permanent expansion because it has the potential to cut child poverty in half across the country. So those are just my brief slides, thank you. That was really helpful and and uh, what a wake up call uh, to to see the the uh, number of families who are eligible and not uh, not uh, taking advantage. So we, there's there's some work to do there. Um, and I also want to ask um, Nancy from Head Start. I'm going to start by asking you: uh, Do you have examples of how uh, the child tax credit and these pro uh, relief provisions have been helping Oregon families and? What have you been hearing in the Head Start program? Um, well, what I've been hearing through the Head Start um, community is that pretty much what the data is showing. Um, they're using it for food. They're using it for essentials such as utilities, um, clothing, diapers, um, a variety of different things. Gas, gas prices, as we all know, have gone up. And so, you know, for those that are, you know, the working poor, to get back and forth to work they're having to to put fuel in their vehicle transportation costs so you know buses things like that where they don't have a vehicle so they're using it they're using it for their daily life um the families are and it's so uh, much needed it really is so much needed and the fact that we you know are looking at it ending here you know as of this month i think is really detrimental to the families here in oregon i couldn't agree with you more and i i, I... Uh, trust that people on this call share that concern, and so we're mm -hmm. we're truly hopeful that uh, I'm I'm an optimist, and I'm hopeful that uh, the Build Back Better Act does get through uh, the Senate, and and we hope soon. So I'm going to put just a, a general big picture question out there: How has the federal response to the pandemic worked? Where has it fallen short, and what more can we be doing to meet the needs of Oregon children and families going forward? And so we don't have a formal you know, program, but I just want to open it up to discussion and you can just unmute or you can wave or you can do the raise hand function in Zoom. So who wants to start? Jennifer, thank you for putting the slide presentation in the chat. So we have that. Thank you. I appreciate that. So I'll, I'll jump in. Thank you, Congresswoman, so much for the opportunity. Um, I think the initial sort of floods of resources to schools have been just tremendous. Um, 
I don't know if you saw, but the graduation rates in Oregon have gone up. And uh, even over the last year when kids were you know, starting to do virtual in the, at the end of 2020, and when we talked to school districts about what's going on, uh, many of them said some of the resources from the federal government that allowed them to partner with organizations like some of the ones on the call, like Right to Know Network, like Self Enhancement, like Kairos, like many others, to really go after families and help understand what's happening with their students, with their kids, to really partner with families in a very different way because kids were at home, um, just having the resources to, to give kids devices and hotspots and all of those things. It's been just phenomenal to not have to worry about where the dollars will come from because as you know, our state can't print the money, right? So really getting resources from the federal government and that really early stage has been helpful. Um, but just a little bit to the, the tax credit, um, we talk to families all the time and we're hearing the same thing. They're spending resources on food and gas and transportation. And the only thing I'll add to that is that the cost of all these things have gone up tremendously more than they have in the last 40 years. So the, the last payment going out today at the same time that the cost of all of these things are going up 20, 30% is just really scary uh, and really uh, worries us in terms of the stress that this will create for families. Um, and I, you know, noted what you said earlier about wanting to make sure kids thrive. It's really hard to thrive when you're stressed. I don't care what situation you're in. It's hard for me to thrive when I'm stressed, right? Um, and so that combination of the tax credit expiring, costs going up, and you know, some of our schools are talking about moving to virtual at some, you know, some portion of the school week, which creates a burden on families to find childcare which is also going, going up, um, just not having those resources available is just really worrisome in terms of the stress that it creates on families and on children and, and their ability to thrive. So we are you know, pushing all of you and your colleagues and those on the Senate side as well to really think about what not passing Build Back, Build Back Better would, would really mean for families and I appreciate your time this morning. Thank you, Tori. And thank you for that, that Im Im important uh, reminder that the child tax credit is expiring today. And, you know, I hear you on the, the issue of costs going up uh, and, and understand that people are very concerned about that. Uh, it, it's a complex um, explanation why that's happening, but there are many steps that the administration is doing to address it. A lot of it is pandemic related workforce issues, for example, products sitting out on ships in ports uh, and, and things just uh, rising because of, of rising costs overall. Fortunately for many, uh, wages are rising as well. And one of the reasons why we absolutely need to get the Build Back Better uh, Act uh, passed is because for many people, their wages aren't rising. Uh, and, and with uh, affordable childcare, uh, universal pre-K, these programs are really gonna make a difference. And for example, the universal pre-K program, there is a requirement that that be, it's gonna take a while to roll it out. It's not gonna happen overnight, but the, the uh, rollout will happen. The targeted areas to start will be those that are the hardest hit in the, the, the low income areas. So there will be a priority to focus on those areas for, for things like universal pre-K. And the childcare dollars, you know, we, we had childcare dollars in every relief bill we've passed since uh, the pandemic started. Care heroes, year-end spending American Relief Plan, because we're hearing again and again uh, how challenging it is for people to find childcare. And yes, it's getting, it, it is expensive. And, and we've been trying to get the, the dollars to providers so they can make their facilities safe, just like with the dollars that went to schools that you mentioned, Toya. It's not a coincidence that the, coincidence that the Education Labor Committee had a, a significant part of the uh, American Rescue Plan and the, the Build Back Better, because these programs are, are really transformational investments in our children. Uh, th thank you for, for pointing the, out the urgency and the, and the stress that people are going through right now, particularly at the holidays when you know, the check is ending, the costs are going up, and, and, and they want to have a, a happy holiday, which is very hard to do with, with stress in their lives. So we're hopeful that the Senate will get something through soon. I well, think Go ahead, Kali. Chime in because you're talking about childcare. I mean, I think you know very well, um, we have a bit of a childcare crisis right now, I think in our country uh, and certainly in our state. I've been traveling in some of our rural areas over the last couple of weeks. And we see in places like Wallowa County, uh, Douglas County, childcare closing because they don't have the workforce to support it. And that is tragic. And in areas such as those, there are not many options to begin with. 
And so access, you know, I think Oregon's rural areas are known to be childcare deserts. Um, and then in our urban areas, we see the closure of a lot of our home-based childcare facilities, which um, disproportionately serve children of color. And so I think Build Back Better is essential to ensuring um, our children thrive. Children zero to five are most likely to live in poverty. And so um, the disproportionate access, I think, of those children that are, are most in need to access in quality childcare is really huge. The child care tax credit is has been incredible. I'm not going to repeat what everyone has said. I think we have seen the same in the communities that we are in and listening to. I think we would love to see an extension beyond even one year if possible. Uh, and so continuing to push for that, continuing in the language of Build Back Better to talk about the importance of culturally responsive and culturally specific child care programs, as well as um, ensuring that we are building a workforce that is, you know, as you well know, uh, Representative Bonamici, our child care workforce is many women and many women of color, and they're getting paid on average $13.50 an hour. Um, it's not living wage, and it's very hard. When I spoke with folks in enterprise, you know, why is there a child care issue? They said, you know, it's very hard to convince people um, to go into this field. We don't have a lot of colleges here. People go away. They don't want to they don't want to be a child care worker. And so how do we really build that workforce um, of folks so that we we are showing that we to me, it shows that we care about our children when we care about the people who are caring for our children, when we prioritize and say, hey, you matter and you are essential in ensuring that our children thrive. Um, it speaks volumes. And I think in other parts of the world where we see childcare successfully thriving, they are paying childcare workers living wages. And so I thank you for your advocacy and your support for Build Back Better. I do see um, that we are we are in a, in a time of crisis um, when children from opportunity are having access to what they need. Um, and I think poverty and access in general to good jobs um, is limited to, to few folks. We see growth in certain industries, but we're not seeing those communities most impacted having access to that growth. So well, those are what, what good points, Kali, thank you. And thank you for pointing out also that uh, there these challenges exist in rural areas as well. And as someone who's honored to represent a district that includes um, several rural areas and counties as well, I'm very much aware of that. And this is a conversation, you know, the, uh, the lack of access to affordable childcare that we were having before the pandemic. And the pandemic has just exacerbated and highlighted the needs and the inequities. And you know, Build Back Better, the way it's structured is with the recognition that um, childcare workers are important, uh, important uh, enough to make a living wage. And so the resources will go to make sure that the, the providers are in fact making a living wage. And also uh, that that is not being, uh, you, you can't just raise tuition to pay for the the salaries of, of childcare workers because it's already too expensive. That's why the investment is so very important uh, because it, it, it has to come from both ends to, to say our families are paying too much, but our providers are not making enough. So we're, we're excited because yesterday I had a conversation uh, where we learned that uh, in many of our, our early childhood education programs are actually seeing an increase in interest. Uh, and, and hopefully that's tied to the, the conversation around Build Back Better with the recognition that childcare workers are, uh, are educated, early childhood educators, and it's how important that is. We recognize also that we need to have a, a system that meets the needs. You mentioned culturally responsive uh, childcare is, is critical. And every family has different needs, uh, depending on where they are and their work schedule. And uh, some may have multiple children of different ages. So we have to have a, a system that's structured to meet all of the needs uh, of our families. And we aren't going to see economic recovery without it. Uh, we, we just won't. And I've had conversations with you know, primarily women uh, out of the workforce because they don't have affordable, accessible childcare. Um, so Build Back Better is designed to, to address these needs uh, and uh, it has the investments to do it. So we, we need to get it over the finish line in the Senate and then continue to work on uh, uh, the long-term investments that we need. And, and again, this is these are investments that, that pay off in the long run. When our children get a good start in life, 
um, they are in, in the early years when we have affordable childcare, when we have paid family leave, when we have uh, addressed the maternal mortality disparities in this country, uh, our children are going to get a better start in life and do better in the K-12 system and better uh, regardless of what path they take. So it is, uh, it is that long-term uh, vision that we need. Uh, and, and here's hoping for a passage in the Senate soon. We'd like to weigh in. What, what are you seeing out there? One thing I wanted to add, um, I just wanted to kind of put, pull the language together. Uh, we've definitely seen the, the positives. And I, I wanna go back to what Toya said is that you know, kids and families can't thrive um, if they're feeling stress and they're in poverty, quite frankly. And one of the things I just wanna highlight is that it really does have an impact on mental health of our youth and our families. And I think we're all seeing that in the schools. And so, yes, to have what they need, they're gonna, they're gonna thrive and do better. But I just wanna highlight, like we're still in this moment where youth and families are feeling a significant challenge and those challenges are really showing up as mental health issues. And so I just wanted to call that out because it's, I know all of us are seeing it in ways that we haven't seen it before. And in some ways it's undefined um, because we see behavior in the classroom and we see kids kind of disengaging but I just want to put a name to it because I think it's important in this conversation. It's critical. Thank you, Tracy. And it's a conversation I've had with uh, school leaders uh, recently. And, and of course, there was stress even before the, the, the pandemic. I mean, think, I've had students tell me that the first thing they do when they get into a classroom is figure out where they can hide and how they can escape because they're doing all these active shooter drills. And, and th those things existed before the pandemic and of course are highlighted with the ongoing um, gun violence in our schools and our communities. Um, and I'd, I'd love to have a conversation about that uh, in, in, a, in another time because there's there, it is a serious concern and the lack of access. I asked students, is there someone at your school you can talk with? And they said, no. And part of it is because of the stigma. I mean, we need to, to destigmatize uh, behavioral health care, mental health care, because students are concerned to reach out because they'll be there. They don't know what people will think of them. So making sure that we have uh, safe access for students to have uh, someone to talk to the behavioral health care, mental health care, and the staffing we need in our in our classrooms so that we we have the, the uh, assistance and our, our educators are able to, to continue teaching with the, the help that they need to to have a, um, a thriving educational experience. It has been very, very challenging during the pandemic to be sure. But again, many of these issues were just exacerbated during the pandemic and existed before. Now, now, we, now we have the opportunity to make, make a difference with, uh, with Build Back Better. But uh, thank you for raising that, Tracy, a very important issue. The other issue that we have is, as you know, wages have gone up, but, um, and many of our families, but the federal poverty level is the same as it's been for what, 40 years? And many of our families are the same families, but maybe they got an increase in their salary or their hourly weight, and it just pushes them right out of resources, but they cannot afford the resources. So somehow we need to either look at adjunct eligibility for some of these so that families can access them. Uh, we see families coming in for a Head Start and they've always had Head Start, but maybe they got a little bump in their hourly wage and now they can't afford, they, they can't come to Head Start, but they can't afford to get childcare or uh, preschool someplace else. So that is a big issue. Um, the dollar doesn't go as far as it used to. And for them, they've already squeezed everything they can get out of that dollar. Yeah, I appreciate that so much. And we'll continue to work on that uh, key issue because we, I mean, we want people's wages to go up, but if it means then they're stuck without uh, being able to afford childcare or the services they need, uh, that's, a, that's not a good place to be. So you're right, we need to update that uh, uh, to, to make sure we aren't uh, creating an additional barrier for families. Um, you know, I'll just lift up a couple of things here for the Latinx community. I think, you know, it's important to remember that we're still only 58% vaccinated. Uh, for youth aged 5 to 12, Latinx youth are only 38% vaccinated, lowest of any ethnic racial group in the state. And, you know, this uh, pandemic has hit our community extraordinarily hard. The numbers of sick, 
sick and dead, uh, lost wages uh, is, you know, just incalculable in terms of the impact to the Latinx community. And of course, that trickles down to our young folks. And we're seeing the extreme stress that's resulting right now in terms of, um, you know, mental health, uh, reentry to school, and the kinds of things we're seeing in terms of um, just inability to, to really uh, to gel back into the school setting. And uh, what we need more than ever is uh, to make these things permanent. Uh, the child tax credit absolutely needs to be made permanent. The inclusion of ITIN holders to include mixed status families is absolutely essential for not just uh, ability to withstand the pandemic, because for our community, we're very much still in the pandemic. It is not over by any stretch. And to start to think about recovery, uh, we have a long, long ways to go to recover from this as a communities of color as a whole, um, but in particular our community. And it's gonna take the making permanent of things like the child tax credit, inclusion of I-10 holders uh, and other measures that are gonna give us just the, the, the merest hope, the merest chance of being able to uh, survive and recover from this pandemic. And so really much appreciate your leadership representative and lifting up uh, those issues. And uh, uh, of course, encouraging strongly our Senate delegation uh, to be uh, extraordinarily strong in, in moving this over to the finish line. Well, thank you so much, Tony. And I, I appreciate that and know uh, communities have been disproportionately hit by the pandemic and affected by the pandemic and particularly the Latinx community. And, you know, we, we've we struggled to find a way to, you know, to make sure that everyone understands that the uh, vaccines are safe and effective and important. Um, sadly, in this country, it's become politicized. Uh, but I really encourage people, you know, to get do those educational efforts with with families and students, and uh, you know, places like Virginia Garcia Memorial Health Center and others with uh, you know bilingual uh, information and explanations and uh, making sure that people have access. You know, I think Washington County was one of the first counties in the uh, in the state to reach 70% vaccination rates, but there are still um, communities that that have have been disproportionately affected. And you know, it's just tragic that we we've just crossed the 800,000 um, death line in this country. You know, with with the percentage of of, uh, of the population that we have globally, I mean, that's just unacceptable and tragic. Um, so, whatever efforts can be made to reach out to to families and communities, to everyone who's eligible for vaccination, I know it's been really tough on on some communities. And I, you know, I encourage people to to talk to someone they know and trust. And um, unfortunately, if uh, politicians telling them to get vaccinated. I think we've, we're past the point where that's effective. Um, I really encourage people to talk with their healthcare provider if they have one or with their family and community members who have been vaccinated to try to get the message across that the vaccines are safe, effective, and, and really important. Uh, and you're right about the, the need to, to close those gaps with, with benefits for the ITIN holders and, and making sure that uh, particularly our hardest hit communities get the relief they need to get through this. You know, sometimes it feels like there's light at the end of the tunnel and then the tunnel gets a little longer and a little darker with things like the new variant. But uh, um, please please let us know what we can do to, to be helpful in, in getting the information there about uh, vaccination rates so that we can get kids back to school safely and people back to work. Thank you for your, your wise words. Uh, Congresswoman, uh, this is Mary Louise. I'd like to join others in thanking you for your incredible leadership on these issues and maybe just build on some of the other things that are being said and, and give you a couple of examples of ripple effects from federal investments uh, by telling you about a couple things that the foundation community is working on in partnership with others. One is, relates to the child tax credit and echo others and ur urging Congress, you and your, your colleagues to do everything you can to extend and make that permanent. But even if the tax credits are not extended, 
what's available, it's still important for families to be able to access what is available now. And you may know that Oregon has, I think, the second lowest uptake rate for the earned income tax credit in the country. And one of the issues is that there's not enough capacity in the state to help families apply, even when they know that those credits are available. So we, and Aaron and and Toyer, both with the Meyer Memorial Trust, both of our foundations are members of a coalition along with uh, the business community and community-based partners that are working on an ask in the next legislative session for uh, additional state investment in capacity. And so that's, that's an example of where state actions can help leverage that huge and important federal investment. And the other is related to childcare. Oregon Community Foundation and the Ford Family Foundation are co-investing in a new approach to the business model of childcare called a Childcare Shared Services Alliance, which is about um, consolidating uh, business structures and supporting networks of child care providers. And the state is co-investing with us using, I believe, ARPA funds. And it's just an example of how it's important for there to be a federal investment, not just in helping families afford child care and make it easier, but also in strategies to make childcare more available as Kali was talking about. Even if families have more dollars in their pockets through childcare subsidies and through the tax credits, if the childcare isn't available in their communities, they can't purchase it. And it's, it's about sort of back-end and, and proactive strategies in, to invest in facilities, to invest in the workforce, to invest in compensation. Uh, so it, it's going to take investment from both directions, both through families and through the infrastructures. And um, again, I can't tell you how important it is that those federal resources are coming in alongside and helping leverage both state and private dollars. So thank you. Th thank you, Mary Louise. And, and uh, I, I think I'll ask some of my colleagues what they've done to, to uh, help spread the word about the earned income tax credit. I think people have done events to try to, to publicize the, the issue uh, to make sure that families get the information. But, but uh, I, I, didn't, I wasn't aware that Oregon was, was falling behind in that area and making sure that everyone who's eligible is, is claiming that. Um, and, and thank you for bringing up the, the creative approach to how do we solve the childcare uh, crisis uh, in Oregon and, and the importance. Yes, it, child care has to be there if, 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 if people get the support to pay for it, but it's not there. It's, it's not an effective system. So I recently had a conversation about the business community and the business community. You know, many businesses think, oh, well, maybe we'll have a child care center. And then they realize, well, that's not in our business model and we're not professionals. And so how do we get input from employers and others who are, it's in their interest to have affordable childcare in the community uh, and come together and find out how do we solve this problem and make the investments we need to so that uh, our economy can thrive uh, when people have access to affordable childcare. You know, I, I want to note a, a little bit of history. Back in the early 70s, there was a universal childcare bill that passed both the U.S. House and Senate. Um, it, with, with bipartisan support. Uh, it, it ended up being vetoed by then President Nixon, but you, you imagine how different things would have been had we had that structure uh, to, to provide for affordable childcare over the past several decades. But uh, now's the time to correct that and, uh, and get the Build Back Better Act uh, passed. So thank you for, for all your work, Mary Louise, and your input. So it is, is there any um, anyone who'd like to talk about what it would mean for families, maybe some stories that help uh, express the, the, the concerns about what affordable childcare means for families, for children? How can we make this, make sure that the investment reaches the most vulnerable families? Any ideas there? Well, I just want to, to, to emphasize again that uh, 
the Build Back Better Act is designed to help close these gaps. Uh, and I and I know that uh, your your work in the community has been helping a lot. Uh, I, I mentioned also that the, the Build Back Better Act, the child care provisions are modeled on the American Families Plan. That's a, a comprehensive approach to address the systemic challenges. So what are your priorities for the coming year? In addition to, uh, you know, if we can get this child care, uh, child tax credit extended, what other priorities do you see for the families and children you serve? Well, actually, I just wanted to circle back to your previous question. Um, I'm just wondering, so we just got funding renewed for rental assistance, and I'm wondering if this is an opportunity to build in a question around the tax credit. So as folks are having that application process for rental assistance, because we're saying it's mostly families, why not also ask that question about, hey, did you know you have access to or potentially have access to this tax credit? Have you filled out an application to get those funds? Because um, I know for our organization, we predominantly worked with uh, communities of color, and I feel like that is an, a real opportunity there to boost those numbers and ensure that folks understand that they have this opportunity to get additional funds. I think that's a great idea um, to to determine at the time uh, that that you're determining eligibility for for rental assistance if if there are children and in, in the family and you said you work mostly with families to make that determination maybe some information about their earned income tax credit as well uh, so that sounds like a great opportunity and a, and a great idea to to make sure that that people are aware of the services that are available great idea Jennifer what about other issues going forward as you as we look forward to the to the new year of 2022 where are the the needs in the community i'll just say well, one second jennifer's comment um we've seen time and again that partnering with community-based organizations even before the pandemic um you know they're our closest allies um and partners to make sure our kids have you know the support and systems they need to thrive and so you know, creating a system or a situation where, you know, many of the colleagues of mine who are on the on the call today are some of the first calls to reach our families is, is just smart business, smart work, um, and really would, you know, advocate for all of that. Um, but before the end of the year, um, in terms of what we're working on, we, you know, know from the IRS that we have until December 28th to get the Senate to move uh, so that if Build Back Better is passed by then, the next payment will go out on the 15th of January without Right. any disruption and so you know Stan is is in nine different states not just in Oregon and so each of us is pushing on our um, Senate um, representatives to make sure that they know that this is something that's really important to Oregon and so the data that Jennifer Wegley pro provided earlier and that many others have um, supported with this uh, data and information has been super helpful for us to make the case we have a little easier task here in Oregon because we have representatives who are very uh, aware and friendly uh, and, and will vote yes when given the opportunity through budget reconciliation, but that's what we are we're, you know, hoping to get that done before the end of the, the calendar year. So thank you for that. Well, thank you, Toya, and thank you for your advocacy. And I, and I know it, it it really does make a difference to families. And as I as I began this process pre-pandemic, uh, looking at the child care system and the child care structure, um, I, I remember a conversation several years ago, a friend of mine was running the child care center at the University of Oregon, and he said that, uh, he, he said to me, you know, you realize that people pay more per hour to park their car than they do to have someone take care of their child. And it just really put things in this perspective of, uh, oh my goodness, it's, a, it's such valuable work. Uh, to have our children cared for. Um, and it's valuable for the children, it's valuable, valuable for parents when they're working, um, and it is a good investment. And when I published my child care report, which I believe was in 20, early 2020, I mean, there's a quote in there from a University of Chicago economist, uh, you know, not, not necessarily a, you know, pr a, a real progressive point of view, but an economic view that this is a good investment uh, in, our, in our children and in our future to make sure that uh, our children get a good start in in life. And so I'm uh, really optimistic, but uh, also encourage that 
the message is getting through that uh, uh, we were able to pass these significant investments uh, in each relief bill, but also in Build Back Better in the House, that people understand that it's, it's, it's about equity and fairness as well, because people with resources will find a way, whether they you know, hire a nanny or uh, go, you know, go to a, uh, uh, an expensive care center that they can pay for themselves. Uh, but that leaves so many people behind and those equity gaps need to be closed so that we have a, a recovery and an economy that, that works for everyone. So wonderful potential here. And uh, thank you for your all, all of your expertise uh, and the work that you're doing in the community. Um, this is going to take everybody working together uh, to, to make sure that we are uh, addressing the needs and that our policies are actually reflective of uh, the needs of the families uh, in, in Oregon and across the country. And that's where these conversations help me tremendously as a policymaker to, to hear from all of you. Anybody have anything they'd like to add to the conversation before we, we close? Well, again, I... Well, I, I was just going to ask an advocacy question. Is there anything those of us who can get involved in advocacy can do to help continue to push for Senate passage? We, we have, we're very lucky that our Oregon senators are uh, leaders and movers and shakers on these issues already, but what else can we do to help? From well, Oregon. You know, continue telling the stories about what this means for families and using the data uh, that you know, the data that Jennifer provided, uh, the the stories about how this is affecting people and it's affecting our economic recovery. And I think it's helpful too to explain because it's a shift. Uh, it's a shift in you know, what we've done over the years. And why why do we need some some people will say, why do we need a government investment? It's because there isn't a market solution to this, because families can't afford childcare, but the providers do not make enough. So you can't raise the tuition so the providers make more, and you can't lower the tuition so families can afford it. There isn't a way to solve this without investment. Um, and so when I when I talk about it that way uh, to, to justify why do we need the investment, and then also add the stories about why this makes a difference in the long term, and why is this a good use of taxpayer dollars. It's a very good use of taxpayer dollars. We've seen uh, predominantly women leaving the workforce because they can't afford childcare. Um, it's a whole range of workers. I had, you know, I've had low income workers, but also university researchers say, I can't go back to my lab because I don't have childcare. So it's the whole range of, of uh, how it's affecting our economy, how it's affecting uh, the communities and families. But then also just, just looking at the, the data of how uh, children who have uh, stable, affordable childcare and preschool are going to do better in the K-12 system. So uh, we've, we, we've seen that, we know that that is um, true. It requires long-term thinking, which sometimes is not in, uh, um, is, is sometimes is in short supply in Congress, but uh, making sure that the data and the stories are there to, to compel um, the policymakers to understand that yes, this is, an, this is a shift in the way that we have structured our childcare systems over the years, but it's an important one uh, for, for equity and for economy and for our economy. And if you, as Toya said, if you, you there are senators in other states, um, if, you, if you have a, a way to outreach to them if through you know, people you know or organizations you're aligned with or family members, uh, Make sure they get that message as well. So uh, again, I think that the, the work that we've done uh, so far to, to structure this in a way that re is really going to make a difference to, to close those gaps is, is very encouraging. And I'm, as, a, as an optimist, hoping that we get it over the finish line. I have a question. I'm just wondering for folks who are like my age, kind of, you know, Anyways, uh, looking to get into child care, I'm just wondering if there's a way to make it count as public service so that you can use it to have your student loans forgiven. Because I think a lot of folks don't go into this work because they can't afford to, because they have loans they have to pay back. Um, even if it's something that they're you know, passionate about, the opportunity is just not there to go into that space. Jennifer, that's a great question. And the public service loan forgiveness program, uh, it, it was designed to help encourage and incentivize people 
incentivize people to go into public service. And, and I certainly see child early childhood education as public service, um, just like K-12 education for people who go to teach in the K-12 education system, that's considered public service. There's no reason why early childhood education should not be as well. The public service loan forgiveness program hasn't been working real well, but we're working on addressing that. Now, fortunately, um, Secretary Cardona, our current Secretary of Education has and the administration, Biden administration, have taken strong steps to make sure that people who made those uh, educational and financial decisions based on the promise of the public service loan forgiveness program are seeing the relief that they're entitled to. And, and we're working on crafting it going forward to make sure that it, it really does work. And overall, we need to make higher education more affordable, um, uh, along with making sure that our early childhood educators are paid a living wage, and that's part of Build Back Better, but also uh, part of uh, what we're doing in, in affordable, uh, accessible higher education as well. It was a great question. Thank you. And, and if anyone else wants to, to weigh in here, the people who work in early childhood education uh, about that, that would be welcome, including maybe Al from my staff or anybody else, if you have anything you'd like to add to the importance of having a, a great early childhood educators. Yeah, I can confirm that uh, licensed and regulated child care, care including Head Start and state funded pre-K does qualify for uh, PSLF. Um, we're going to look into whether or not uh, child care, in-home child care does. Um, that's something that came up recently in a conversation, but you're, you're right that that is important and, and is included in PSLF. And I'll post a link to the Congresswoman's um, conversation she had on the public, the public student loan forgiveness just a couple weeks ago in the chat. Thank you all. Well, thank you again, everyone. It's been a great conversation, re really beneficial for me to hear your perspective. And as we, as we go forward, um, anyone else wanna add anything before we close? Well, thank you so much again, everyone. Really appreciate your expertise and your passion. Stay safe and have a great holiday. Take care, everyone. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.